How long has it been since we've just uh, been with the Lord? I, it, one of the verses said, uh, since you rose up early in the morning. And I, I, I pray that uh, I did that this morning when the dawn came up. I was awake praying this morning and praying God's blessings upon all of you and on all the churches. As a matter of fact, I spent some time this morning just praying for every church that the Lord would put on my mind. And that took a while. I think I covered most of Georgia, other states in there. Um, so uh, pray God's blessings on all of God's kingdom. Amen. Um, and uh, Mark said he was thinking about Gilligan's Island when Rick said the, the, uh, the, the, the tour in uh, Chattanooga, the riverboat. Uh, I went to college in Chattanooga. Y'all go ahead and pick them up. First thing I thought of was, was this a gambling trip? They got gambling cruises out there, so Jim, you can't gamble if you go now. You'll just have to keep your money at home. Of course, we could take the Dream Fund, and I could, you know, I don't think so. I don't think so. That was a joke, folks, so y'all didn't laugh. Someone donated us a, a lectern. They felt sorry for me, so they got me a lectern up here. I appreciate all that. Take your Bible and open it to 1 Samuel chapter number 3. All my life I've heard about the Father God. I can't ever remember a time in my life when people have not talked about the Father God. From the stories of creation um, to the plans that God has for us. And uh, let me tell you, the first time that I ever heard from God, I was seven years old when I personally heard from God. I was not a Christian. Um, I had a cousin that was at the house that was going, uh, they, they were visiting. We were playing in the back, backyard. And this may, may not make sense to anyone else, but they were going through a very difficult time. And I found myself comforting them. Um, today I would look at it and say I was ministering to their spirit. And it was unique because at that point in time, not even a Christian yet, God said this is what you're going to do for your life. Now, when you're a seven-year-old kid, you think about being a, a policeman or a fireman or an astronaut. Seven-year-old kid, I, that was 1969. NASA was pumping, and, and I was thinking about that, you know, walking on the moon and all that kind of stuff. But God said to me at that point, totally unannounced. I mean, I just, he just said, this is what you're going to do your whole life. I've heard about my God, Father God my whole life. I've heard about Jesus all my life. I've read the New Testament, and I've seen his love. I've heard about the greatest gift of love I think I've ever heard about, and that's the cross of Calvary. Everything changed there. Heaven came down and opened up a door where us sinners, all of us sinners, could have a path to heaven. And I first became convicted of my sins when I was nine years old, gave my heart and life to Christ when I was ten. And I, I've heard the voice of God. But when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, came to live within me. And there's never been a moment, there's never been a day, there's never been a time that He's left. He has always been there. He has been the one to lead me, to guide me, to direct me, to give me wisdom, to bring correction in my life to bring an urging in my life. There has been an impulse. There has been the, all the doors that he's opened, all the, the words that he's shared have come through the avenue of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I know that we're Baptists, and I'm a Baptist by choice. I, I tell everybody I was raised a Baptist, but I chose to be a Baptist after that. Our Southern Baptist Convention is this week. And there's a lot of things that are going on in our convention. And a lot of people say, I don't know if I want to continue to be a Southern Baptist because of this or because of that. But I choose to be a Baptist. But listen, I'm first a Christian. I'm first a Christian. But us Baptists seem to be a little nervous of the Holy Spirit. We've seen what we call extremes. And I think because of that, we have, in my opinion, we have backed up way too much. We give Father God the glory He deserves. And in heaven now they sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We give Jesus Christ 
He is the author and the finisher of the faith. He is the, there is no other name given among heaven whereby men must be saved. And we give Jesus Christ the credit for what he did. But never overlook God's gift of the Holy Spirit. When I began to uh, think about this, I, I, I just felt led to, to take a series of sermons and speak on the Holy Spirit. But that was months ago, and the Lord has been shaping my thoughts. And I began to think of all the things that I, I wanted to say about the Holy Spirit. And to be real honest, I could talk from now until the end of the year, and I could not exhaust it. I could give you good new information every week because there's so much to be said about the Holy Spirit. Obviously, you don't want me to do that. And and the Holy Spirit did not want me to do that. So I began to fine-tune what it was that that God wanted me to to speak about at this time in our church and in in our walk with God and and in the life of what God is doing. And I really came to the point of I want to talk about hearing the Holy Spirit. I want to hear those words, come, Holy Spirit. Speak, Holy Spirit. So if you, if you have your Bibles, open them up to uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 3 and stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. Lord, help me to say everything I need to say. Nothing more, but Lord, nothing less. 1 Samuel chapter 3 Let's begin in verse 1. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the, Lord, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. It's not that God didn't speak, but he rarely spoke because the people were not listening. It's not that God did not want to speak. It's not that God did not have a word to say. But they, it was rare because the people were far from God and were not listening to the Lord. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was lying down in the place, and when his eyes had begun to grow dim, or to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. Eli said, I did not call. Lie down again. And he went and laid down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you are calling me. He answered, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not know yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. God even speaks to children who are lost. God even begins the process of calling them to himself, even then. So look in verse 8. The Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Now listen, Eli had come to a place. Eli was the prophet. We would call him chief priest. But he could not hear the voice of God. He was a man of God. He had walked with God. He knew the wisdom and the leadership of God. But in his life, he had grown to a place where he could not perceive or hear the voice of God. But he perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Verse 9, Then Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. I like that. It, it, It gives us a picture of the Lord being close. The Lord was there standing speaking to him. You know, I wonder if we are so blind to it that the Lord is close, 
and yet we don't see it. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. May the Lord do it again. May the Lord do it again. Let's pray. Father, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that is open to anything and everything you so wish to do. We love you. We thank you for loving us first. Now, Father, in this service, in honor of your spoken word, Holy Spirit, join us, preach, and may we listen and hear your invitation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Learning to hear the voice of God is the solution to a thousand problems. It's the key to knowing God. It's the key to the proper view of yourself. The voice of God is love. The voice of God is power. The voice of God is healing. The voice of God is wisdom. The voice of God is joy. And we haven't heard it nearly enough. Neuroscientists tell us that every one of us hear 80,000 thoughts per day. 80,000 thoughts per day. To some of y'all who drink seven or eight cups of coffee, you may go over 100,000 thoughts. I don't know. Some of you, maybe you only get up to about 30,000 thoughts. I don't know about you either. But listen, all of us receive about 80,000 thoughts a day. Now, that's the, that's the thing about just being human. You can't turn your mind off. You're always seeing. You're always thinking. You're always looking at things. You're always trying to figure things out. Your brain never turns off 24-7. But then the neuroscientists go on to say this. About 80% of those thoughts, that's about 64,000 thoughts, are negative. Four out of five thoughts are negative. Four out of five thoughts, when we see things, we twist it and see the negative. Four out of five thoughts, we look at it and we're discouraged. Four out of five thoughts, we look at it and we feel alone. Four out of five thoughts, we look at it and we see hopelessness. We see an end. We see conflict. We see uh, anger. We see bitterness. We see brokenness. Four out of five thoughts, we're looking at something and saying it could be better. But 20% of those thoughts, or 16,000 thoughts a day, we're hearing something say, you know, this is pretty good. This could be good. This is something we need to think about. This is something we need to, what could God do here? What could I do here? What should I do here? Now, in that, by the way, you may call yourself a good person. You may call yourself a bad person. And I think it's hard for us to hear the voice of God if we're so beaten down what Stephen Furtick in his book calls chatter. He wrote a book called The Chatterbox. All this noise that's going on in our life, all of this stuff that's going on to distract us and take us away. You can be listening to me. You could be absolutely tuned into the Word of God and be gone thinking about your grocery list in a second. Where am I going to eat lunch? What am I going to do this afternoon? <clears throat> I really can't believe he wore that shirt. You know we got an ugly preacher. I got an amen out of that. I mean, you got to speak the truth, right? There are things that will come to your mind that are totally out of the blue. And hearing all of that noise, hearing all of that chatter, how can we differentiate to hear 
the voice of God. I don't know that there's ever been a time where we need to hear the voice of God more than we do right now. Followers of God, is the Lord the loudest voice in your life? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. When I was thinking about that, and, and I heard, for your servant is hearing or listening. You know the first thing that went to my mind? Deuteronomy 6. Every Jew knew the Shema. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. But the reason they call it the Shema is at the beginning of that, he says, listen, Israel. Then he makes the statement, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and we shall love him. Sometimes, I think the Holy Spirit needs to come and rattle our cage a little bit and say, listen, are you listening? Could it be that the Lord is close and trying to speak, but is being ignored? Could it be that the Lord has something that He wants to say to you? In studying this, I've really come to believe that we're a snowflake. Y'all have ever heard that? There's no one else in all the world, in all of time, that is like you. You are fashioned in the image of God, yes. But you are fashioned uniquely for Him, yes. And God has a specific and a personal and a loving word for you. And I've really come, listen to me now, I've really come to believe that God has a language just for you. I remember hearing people say, oh, when we get to heaven, we'll all speak English. What? I've had people have, well, it must be the Hebrew, the old Hebrew. Where in the world do people get this? But you see, what I have learned is that I have an ear to the Holy Spirit to hear what God is uniquely saying for me. So do you. Hear. Listen. Oh, yes, we'll say we uh, love and we agree. There is one God, and, and, and we need to love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But what, does it, what good does it do if we don't ever get to the place where we hear? Take your Bible, look over in 1 Kings chapter number 19. Here's the story of Elijah. And Elijah had just gone through one of the greatest moments in all of Scripture. He had... He had been listening to God and walking with God, and God had been using him in an amazing, mighty way. And in 1 Kings 18, there's the showdown on Mount Carmel, and, and it's the showdown between Baal and all the false prophets and, and Elisha, the prophet of the one God. And they built the, the offering there, and, and Elijah prayed a simple prayer, and the fire from heaven came down and just consumed that altar. And everyone said, the Lord is one. The Lord is God. The Lord is one. It was an awakening moment. God used Elijah in a mighty way. And after that, Elijah prayed. And after three and a half years of no rain, it began to rain. But from the mountaintop experience, as often happens, he found himself in the lowest pits of despair. Have you ever been there? When everything was great, when everything was wonderful, when everything was magnificent, it couldn't get any better, and you downward spiral, and you don't know how you got there. And Elijah was having one of those woe is me moments. Look what it says here in verse number 8. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 8. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. 
There he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, God spoke to him. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? I've had that same conversation with the Lord myself. God came to me and said, what in the world are you doing? You know, that's a question we all need to answer. What in this world are you doing? So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord of God, Lord God of hosts, like he needed to tell God that. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. That's a lie. At the showdown at Mount Carmel, they killed the prophets of Baal. There was a revival among the people of Israel. But all Elijah could hear was the chatter. The chatter. Then God said, go out out of the cave that he was at. Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. Wow. This is what happened. A great and a strong wind tore into the mountain, broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. I mean, wind tearing the rocks apart. I've heard Tornadoes with mighty power. I've seen the effects of them. I've heard people say they sound like a train. I experienced one in the middle of the night. And yet, could you imagine a wind blowing so hard that it just ripped apart the rocks of the mountain that were there? You know, Elijah had to look at that and was absolutely amazed at what his eyes saw. Amen? But listen, it says, but the Lord was not in the wind. Afterward, after the wind... An earthquake. You know, we have earthquakes that have been felt thousands of miles away. There are earthquakes that have been heard 600 miles away. And he feels as God makes the mountain tremble before him. Look what it says. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. I have seen a fire. A consuming fire. A hot fire. A quenching fire. And yet, it says, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire... New King James says, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and went out, stood in the entrance of the cave, and suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? God spoke in a whisper. Listen to me, church. God speaks in a whisper. I looked at all the translations of this verse. The CSB says, a soft whisper. The NIV says, a gentle whisper. The ESV says a low whisper. The New American Standard says a gentle blowing. The BBE says, listen to this now, I like this one, the sound of a soft breath. King James, a still, small voice. How strong was the wind? How strong was the earthquake? How strong was the fire? But he was heard 
in the gentle blowing of the voice of God. When I want to be heard, and by the way, God gave me this voice. I can be heard. And Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, says God never called anyone that God didn't give the voice to be heard. Well, I guess I thought that that meant loud. He really maybe was talking about that your voice be heard by the amen of the Holy Spirit, but I don't know. I grew up preaching without a microphone. I don't need a microphone in this building today. The camera, I need a microphone for the camera. I can't speak loud enough to get into that camera where people can hear me at home. But I have a voice. And have you ever seen anybody try to get their point across, and the more they wanted to get the point across, the louder they got? You ever seen anybody get angry, and they got louder and stomped and shouted? And I've, I, The old preachers used to say that you weren't preaching till you preached so hard that you had sweat dropping off your tie. Well, God speaks in a whisper. I have a sister-in-law, and she's a unique person. She married my brother-in-law, my wife's brother. And when she, when the kids were rowdy, and I guarantee you my kids were rowdy, and when you might have five or six or seven kids running around playing, throwing footballs in the house and all that, and I'm over going, quit that, you know, stop it. She would go, you don't need to do that inside. And I, I, I was like, what? And this is what I began to notice. The kids got quiet because she got quieter. And what I noticed in my own, when, when she would speak in that quiet voice, I would lean in to hear. I would get close. I wonder if God is trying to say to us, come close. Let me whisper into your ear. This is the way God chooses to speak. This is the way He wants to let His way be known. There is two words in the Bible for the word time. One is the word chronos. It's the ticking of a clock. It is the word where we get our word chronology. It's how we keep up with time. But there's another word in the Bible for time, kiros. And it's speaking of a, a moment. It's speaking of a time referencing something that happened. You ever been talking to someone and say, do you remember the time? Do you remember the time? And you're, you're, you're talking about something unique that happened that was impactful upon you. And you have a memory there. It meant something to you. If I talk to you about the, the, the... All of us have those moments in time. And we've all had some God moments. When I spoke to you at the beginning and I said when I was seven years old, when I heard the voice of God, it wasn't an audible voice and He didn't shout. He just simply said, Brian... This is what you're going to do in your life. You're going to minister to people. I didn't even know what that meant, but I can remember it to this day. The day before I got saved, when I, God had been working on me for months and months, and the day before I got saved, God put a situation together where my father and I spent some time, and, and my dad asked me about it because he knew my spirit was troubled. He, he knew something was going on there. And we began to have a conversation. And I've told you about that conversation many times before. But I can tell you, I, it's like I was there. I, it's like I can, I'm right there thinking about it even now. It's a kiros. It's a moment of time. I remember when I was in my townhouse and I was preaching another sermon to the walls. And God said to me, you realize I'm calling you to preach. And I fell back into my couch. I had a 
one of those overstuffed camel couches, and I, I fell back into it. And I do not know how long Kiros, or excuse me, Kronos, I was there. I really don't know if I sat there 10 minutes or hours because really time had stood still in that moment because I had a God moment and I never argued with God and I said, yes. And I, pro I asked him, I said, Lord, I will, but two things. And I asked of God two things, one of which he answered within a month, one of which I haven't seen answered yet, but I believe he answered it all those years ago. But in the, in the Cronus, it hasn't come here yet. But in my spirit, in the Kiros, it's happened because God spoke. When God saved my soul, wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life, he put me in heaven even then. And I'm living my life as a follower of God because now I know Kronos, I'm not there yet. But Kiros, I'm living in the moment. To hear the voice of God. The voice of God is what we need to hear. It's what we need to tune into. When you open your Bible, are you just reading or are you waiting to hear God speak? In a song, He can speak. When you're walking, He can speak. I've been in a stadium with thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people, and I've heard God speak over the noise from His Spirit to my Spirit. Now, I don't need to hear a thousand times. One time will do. You see, because the Word... Some of the things God's told me, He's had to tell me more than once because I wasn't ready to listen. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, I'm ready to hear. Let me draw close so you can whisper in. Speak, Lord. What is it God's saying to you? Have we grown dull to the hearing? Has the chatter, all the things, has it, has it deafened us down? What is it that God's told us that we didn't say yes to? And because we didn't say yes to it, the voice is getting softer and softer and softer. Are you ready today? They say, Lord, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.